Hello and welcome to Stress and Resilience in the Pandemic and Beyond, the third in our series of conversations about the pandemic and its consequences. I'm Eva Emerson, the Editor-in-Chief of Knowable Magazine from Annual Reviews. People deal with stress all the time and most do so fairly well, but this year has been very unusual. Um, in a Kaiser Family Foundation poll, more than half of Americans said worry or stress related to the pandemic had affected their mental or physical health. Um, there's been huge progress, but there's just so many uncertainties about the virus. Our daily lives have changed. Our decision-making is up in the air as we try to, to navigate risks and a lot of unknowns. Um, people are sick, um, cases are going up, deaths are going up, people are losing their jobs. So yes, there's a lot of stressors this year. Um, and now the holidays are just about here. So take a deep breath. Um, as a biology student, I tend to think of stress as kind of a fear related kind of thing where you have a physiological reaction, a condition that threatens or challenges or imposes severe demands on the body and mind. And maybe your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your hormone levels are affected, your brain. Um, the psychological definition of stress brings a new level of complication to that because it involves the word feeling, um, which that's for me is where I'm really glad today that we have two psychologists here who can help me with those very complicated how we feel and behave. Um, Today we're going to hear from them. They've both done extensive research on people living through or recovering from extremely stressful circumstances. Their work has helped to reveal the ways that people can cope with the stress of an HIV diagnosis or thrive after the loss of a lived one or the experience of a traumatic event. They are Judy Moskowitz, a professor of medical and social sciences at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Judy is also the Director of Research at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine and President of the International Positive Psychology Association. And also joining us today is George Bonanno, Professor of Clinical Psychology at Columbia Teachers College. He's the Director of the Loss, Trauma, and Emotion Lab and author of the book, The Other Side of Sadness, which looks at bereavement. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone to add their questions to the chat and um, feel free to chat with each other. I know on our sourdough event, people gave each other many baking tips, which was very fun. Um, <laughs> if, if we don't address your questions during our conversation, we will take some 20 minutes or so in the last part to address as many as we can. Judy and George, thanks so much for joining us to talk about stress. I wonder if first you could each explain how you got interested in studying the response to stress. Judy, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, so this work started for me about 20, 25 years ago. I was um, a postdoc. I was studying stress and emotion and coping. And I was working on a study of men caring for their partners with AIDS. And this was before the more effective treatment. So AIDS was essentially a terminal illness. So we were studying the caregivers and looking at what they were experiencing, the stress they were experiencing and how they were coping with it. And one, there were many interesting findings from this study, but one of the really interesting findings was that um, not everyone was devastated. There was a range mm -hmm. of responses to this event. They were, they were certainly depressed and distressed, but they were also managing to cope well and adaptively with it. And that sort of started me on this path to looking at ways people can cope with both extreme stressful events, as well as, you know, more sort of daily hassles um, and looking at how they can do that adaptively. Okay. And, and George, do you want to tell us about your experience? How did you find stress? Yes. Well, um, I think I found stress by accident. Um, I was, um, I, I took a position somewhat reluctant to, reluctantly in San Francisco also. Uh, Judy and I, I think we're in San Francisco at the same time um, before we met each other. Um, and um, this was to study bereavement. And 
I was, as I mentioned, I wasn't wildly enthusiastic about that. I didn't know much about bereavement, but then I got, of course, very interested in it. And we were finding pretty early on that a lot of people cope with loss remarkably well. Um, we also found that um, people, um, most people are not spared from stress when something really aversive happens. Um, but they end up sort of working through it or, or getting through it in order to um, to to be resilient to that to that event, and that led to a very interesting um, idea, really. That that as we typically think about these events as you know some bad thing happens and bam you have either PTSD or some horrible response or complicated grief or not. That in fact there's a period of time when when most people are struggling with with the reactions at that event and they find a way through those reactions. So it's a, it, it transpires over a longer period of time. And then my, you know, my work is then shifted to over time to all kinds of other things. As we joke in my lab, anything bad that happens to somebody is what we want to study. You know? so. I mean, presumably to, to help people. <laughs> to help people. Yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, great. Let's let's start a little bit talking about some of that bad stuff, um, stress, and kind of its many forms. I think um, I forgot we had done a story maybe last year about the kind of ten things to know about stress and health, and um, the list we got of showing stress, possibly stressful events in people's life from the American Stress Institute was everything from like divorce, job loss, death of a loved one to changing the amount number of times you go to church a month i mean it was really just like anything so i wonder if you guys could talk kind of about that spectrum of stress um and how you think about it kind of in teeny little day-to-day -day stuff intense short-lived and then long lasting yeah i mean it's interesting because there there is a lot of sort of individual variability in what is considered stressful. And two people can experience the objectively same event and have very different reactions to it. They'll interpret it differently and then have different emotional reactions. So one might find it very stressful and the other one might find it less so. So, you know, changing the number of times you go to church for one person would be could be very stressful for them and for another person it doesn't even uh you know show up on their radar so you know there are definitely events that are pretty universally uh impactful and are perceived as stressful so you know i think the covid pandemic is pretty much labeled as a stressor for everyone <laughs> to some extent. Um, but again, there's variability within that. Like for some people, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to them and it is extremely stressful. And for others, it's hard and inconvenient, but it isn't the worst thing that's ever happened to them. There's a lot of individual difference in, in how they perceive the, the, the pandemic and other types of events. Right. And George, did you want to say something about the spectrum? Yeah, I think um, to add to what, what Judy had said, um, I think over time I've come to think of the way we confront stressors is, is really um, that, that, that really happens on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in much more smaller moments than we, I think, typically think of them. So, you know, something happens to us, and we feel uncomfortable, or we, you know, we feel something that could be stress, or it could be, uh, you know, just momentary sense of unease, and we we can manage that, or we can not manage it. But even in the big events that happen to us, they still occur in in smaller pieces. And you know, we when we think about coping with a large event, we we tend to again think of it as you know, you're coping with this thing, but in fact, this thing. Is 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 moment? It, it has its own small little pieces as well, and so they're constantly changing and constantly readjusting. And I think that's where you get a lot of the individual variation: is that how well people manage those constantly shifting moments in time when when new challenges are confronting us. Um, yeah. When we break it down that way. 
And, and Judy, mm -hmm. something you said that I thought was interesting, and you said it's about how people perceive it. So, so is that getting back into how we feel about it or how we label how we feel about it? It, it does get back to how you feel about it, how you interpret an event determines to a large extent your emotional reaction. So again, going back to the example of two people experiencing the same event, um, the one I use a lot is, a, you know, if you're taking the bus somewhere and the bus is late, um, two people who are both waiting for that same bus might have very different interpretations. One person is going to be late for work and they're going to be fired <laughs> if they're late for work. And the other person is just going to the library, right? <laughs> so the consequence of them being late for the library is not nearly as significant. Yeah. So the, the, the yeah. second person is not going to be as stressed. It's not going to have the same emotional reaction to the objectively same event. And what George was saying about, you know, big events, really, there is there are a series of um, occurrences that we interpret, that we appraise, and then, you know, appraise as stressful or not, and then deal with it or not. Um, and that these, these can accumulate uh, as well. But again, there's this individual difference in how people appraise the events and how they then cope with it and yeah. the emotional reaction from it. Yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. is one thing that, um, you know, I I wonder just like as I was was preparing for this, you know, I definitely was noticing all of the media stories about how, you know, we're all stressed out and all of our emails from our HR department saying, you know, we know you're stressed out. And um, and part of me feels really like, yeah, I am stressed out. And then part of me thinks like, well, I'm, I'm kind of doing OK. And I wonder um, what's your sense of kind of does it help to kind of create a, a like saying like people are stressed, it's okay? Or does it make us think, oh yes, I am stressed? I actually bristle at that idea <laughs> because I think I don't want somebody telling me whether I'm stressed or not. You know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's way too presumptuous. And, and I think also we sometimes tell people, telling people that they're stressed, it, 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 um, it may be counterproductive because people might think, well, I'm not stressed. Should I be stressed? Am I supposed What's to be wrong stressed? With me? What's wrong yeah. with me? And that does, there's lots of evidence that that happens actually. You know, I often think of this more in terms of how, and Judy mentioned appraisal, which is a huge part of this, I think. It's how you're seeing the situation. And then I think there's another huge part is what you actually do, right? So if you, you could just say, I, I, I can't deal with this. I don't want to think about it. Put it out of your mind. And then you relax a little bit, but then you turn around the next day and it's still there, right? So that didn't work so well. Or you may try something else that, you know, in this moment in time, I'm going to, I'm going to really think this through and, 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 and ponder it a little bit because I should be worried about this because this is important. But then maybe that's the wrong strategy. And it's really about the, it's so how people see what's happening to them, what they do about it, all these things come together over time. To determine whether or not we're going to, you know, manage ourselves well, or things are going to get worse, and you know, it's 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 a it's a multifaceted process. Yeah, and I and I think a more productive message from HR, instead of saying you're stressed, we know you're stressed, is you may be stressed. Some people are feeling very stressed, so mm. you sort of normalize the whole continuum. Oh. Um, and give people they sort of permission did say to that. be like, yeah, I am. <laughs> right? Well, no, but Sorry. I mean, what, but, you, but what you heard was different. So that's important. Yeah. They need to say it better, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think sort of normalizing it so that people aren't like, uh, you know, they hear the message and they're like, I'm really stressed. I'm not supposed to be stressed or I'm not stressed. What's weird? What's wrong with me? Right? So yeah. like it's, it's sort yeah. of normalizing the whole process. And again, you know, I keep going back to this people react differently. There are individual differences in this. And, and it, it, we, what we don't want to say is you're, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're feeling it wrong. Right. Right. So that's, without, that's, I guess, without negating the people who really are struggling. Right. Right. Yeah. Genuinely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so I'm, I think when we spoke before you guys said you both have been just called in a little bit, just, kind of casually to to be on the stress front lines i wonder 
Um, I think Judy said you you were called into something in your department or something. I wondered if you. I'm just curious about that. How being a stress expert is 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 um, how how you're being called upon to help in this time of when everyone's you know possibly having some stress. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, um, being known as the stress expert, uh, you know, I get there's you know press and you know in the department they were saying well what can we do to cope with the stress and you know my response is well here's the program that i am doing research on we know that it can work so try these things so that's more you know sort of um coaching people through things that they can do to maybe feel a little better in the moment um uh versus, you know, here's the one way to fix it, um, which, you know, there isn't one way to fix it. There's there are some things you can do that may be helpful for you. Um, so I sort of coach people through that. Um, I talk a lot about sort of normalizing the stress and having self-compassion, no matter whatever you happen to be feeling, it's okay and it's normal. And, you know, there are things you can do to feel better. George, um, I was just thinking when we were talking about, you know, messages that everybody's stressed and then people feeling like, oh, no, what if I'm not stressed? What's wrong with me? That mm -hmm. sounds a lot like um, a, li a little bit of your work on bereavement um, and how people um, felt like there was a certain way you had to act. And then if they didn't feel yeah. that or act like that, they felt somewhat I don't know, weird. What was that effect of kind of having the expectation of, of well, what that I, I think, yeah. Back in the day, um, I think I think it's still a popular model. There was the the stages of grief model, um, which was um, still is probably enormously popular. And that 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 perspective um, kind of tells people, here's what you will go through. This is what you sh will experience. And many people don't experience those 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 pieces, and in fact, there's no empirical support for it really at all. Um, so it's 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 potentially harmful for the very re this very reason that that people assume they should be feeling something and they're not. And I think on, at the broader level, something really interesting about all this is, and this is something that I've only in recent years really come to appreciate that there are a couple of different things. I actually have been calling this the flexibility mindset, um, for lack of a better term. But it's it's sort of this idea that I'll do it. I'll be able to deal with this. I'll 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 survive this. I'll cope with it. I'll deal with it. Um, you know. And there's various pieces that go in this optimism. Uh, sometimes people call call this another dimension: coping, self-efficacy. Uh, how these things interact, and it's. Really important, I think, to communicate that, that, I mean, one of the things that my research has focused on for so long, for, for decades now, is that most people are actually resilient to even the worst things. Um, not everybody, and that's very important, not everybody, but around two thirds typically on average across all these events. We recently did a review and we found around two thirds across all kinds of events, around two thirds of the people show basically a pretty stable health even despite they went through something really adverse, they still show this stable health. And that means that people will be okay, on, uh, uh, you know, for the most part. And often when I'm on these, I've been invited to participate in a lot of webinars or speak with the press. And that's almost, sometimes when the press calls, I tell them, just let's cut to the end part where you're gonna stick me in at the end of the article. And I'm gonna say, well, no, they'll be okay. Which is what, what I often end up, that's often where I end up in, in articles. Um, and I think that it's, I mean, we don't want to com communicate that this is no big deal. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it because we do have to struggle with these things. And as Judy pointed out, the COVID crisis is really demanding in so many different ways. But by the same token, I think we can do it. And I think for the most part, we have done it. Um, you know, human beings are adapting to this. Um, maybe we don't want to go too far down that road because it's all a little crazy at times. <laughs> but um you know, I think that it's really important that people have a sense that they will get through this because that is a really important ingredient of actually doing the kind of coping, the, the more difficult part. If you feel like you can do it, you will do it. You know, you will sort of put the effort in to work out what it is you need to do, how you should do it. And I think that's really important. 
So maybe, um, if getting back to your HR example, maybe they could say something like, you know, um, <laughs> people, you, we have the capability to do this. We can do this. And so, yeah. we, but we need to do it together, you know, et cetera. Something yeah. Like that. Yeah. I think that's a really good transition as much as I like to focus on the problem of stress, because I think one of my coping mechanisms might be complaining. Um, but I, Very I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if- But it has to take a phone call. HR is on the phone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really am going to get in trouble now. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I, we've been kind of focusing on, I mean, I think on, on the problem and, and maybe let's start talking about what we can do to get to that end point that you were just talking about, George. And Judy, um, let's start with you. And I mean, I know you, you do a lot of research actually on interventions and helping people cope. Mm -hmm. And what does the research say about some of the main ways that are that people do cope, um, healthy and unhealthy? Yeah, so um there are a lot of ways to look at the coping response, which is, um, you know, when you're when you're when something is stressful and you're experiencing those emotions associated with feeling stress. Um, there are a number of sort of cognitive and behavioral things that people do just to deal with that negative feeling, to deal with that stress. So sometimes it is uh, what we call problem focused coping, where you identify the source of the stress and you you really address that problem um, that can work when it's something you have control over <laughs> where you can actually do something and then there's a, a big group of types of responses that we call emotion focused coping that sort of focuses on the emotions and the you know generally negative emotions that come out of the stress um, the stressor the stressful event um, and this can be everything from sort of um, distancing yourself from the stressor or distraction, which can be very adaptive. Um, um, escapism, sometimes just doing something to just forget about it for a while, again, can be adaptive. It really depends on the circumstance. And then the types of emotion focused coping that we've been focused on in, in my research team most recently are types of things you can do to increase your experience of positive emotion, even when you're experiencing stress. So this is something we learned from the AIDS caregivers early on that even though they were in a very stressful situation that you know led to a lot of negative emotions, they were also able to experience positive emotions alongside it. So we've put together a program, a set of skills, you can think of them as coping skills that have been shown to increase momentary experiences of positive emotion, which help you sort of take a break from the ongoing stress. So it's things like gratitude, um, noticing positive events and savoring them, acts of kindness. We have a, we have a, a program that, um, we tested in groups experiencing different types of stress, all kinds of health related stress, major life stress, less um, daily hassles or less stressful things. And, and, and we teach people how to um, use these sort of tools uh, to have more positive emotion. And then we think that this helps build up their resources for coping with stress sort of in the moment and going forward. Great. Um, are some of these, I wonder if you could talk about kind of unhealthy versus healthy. I mean, are, are, are some ways we cope really to be, get dangerous? Like, I mean, I'm just thinking of like stress eating or, um, there, there are definitely ways of coping that generally are unhealthy. Um, but it really depends on the context and the situation. So sometimes, you know, eating a chocolate cake is a bad idea if you do it for a long time. But, you know, once in a while, chocolate makes you happy. <laughs> I would say that can be adaptive. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, George, your model speaks to the context uh, and when when types of coping can be beneficial or not. 
as well. Yeah, very much, very much so. Um, that's in the the work on flexibility that that we've done. Um, and it's very much, I think you said it, Judy, you said the, the key phrase, it depends on the context. So every situation is different and how we get through that particular situation. Um, I, I often think of the story someone told me once of um, they decided I'm going to just get this off my mind so I can do what I need to do, get back in my life. I'm going to stop thinking about this bad thing that happened to me and I'm going to drink tonight and watch bad movies. I'm just gonna sit there and drink and watch bad movies. I'm not talking about myself, by the way. Um, and and it, actually didn't, it actually didn't work, which is interesting. It didn't make the, that, that person feel any better, but he then said, well, but at least I was in control. I was deciding to do that and that made me feel better. So even though you know it wasn't necessarily effective in, in making him feel better, it did give him a sense that he was going to take charge of the situation. So, you know, it's not anything you would typically be advised to do. Um, but I would add one more component. So there's the kind of what's the situation, what's happening, and what will work in this situation. But I think we also have to, we always need a kind of a feedback, um, some kind of mechanism for feedback where we say, I think this should work here. I'm going to do this to, to help myself. And it doesn't work. And we need to be paying attention to that feedback. We need to, you know, the feedback is that our own bodies will tell us if it's working or not, but also other people around us might be telling us that, you know, as well. And I think that's a really cru crucial part of this whole process is sort of paying attention to the results of what, what you try. And we learn from that, you know, we, and, and we also, and in and, and something like the COVID crisis, I think that's crucial because, because a lot of the stressors in the COVID crisis are so unique, right? They're, they're things we haven't had that, to deal with, like lockdown is not something most of us have gone through. Um, so we try to find ways to deal with that and we find out what works and what doesn't. But then two months later, um, we find out maybe this isn't working anymore because the, 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 the game has changed a little bit. I think a great example was actually Zoom connection. People were reaching out mm -hmm. to other people on Zoom a lot or, you know, Zoom or any other um, vehicle for video chat. And they were, people were reaching out to other people, making those connections, which, and all the research seemed to support that that was a really good thing to be doing. And it still is a good thing to be doing, except we all got a little tired of it, I think, right? And so we have to find other ways that we're now at a different phase in this process. I, I wonder, George, can you talk about a little bit about the difference between coping and resilience? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, in at least the way I think about it, and I think... Um, I, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I think the way I think about it is the right way to think about it. But um, I, you know, I think that the idea of resilience is it's really it, it's a, it's about time. It has to we have to we have to bring time into the question um, because we're resilient to something, right? We it, we're only resilient to something. So something happens to us, and then we're resi we're either resilient to it or not, and that is a, a matter of time. And it's really an outcome; it's the result of whatever we've done. So coping is kind of how we manage the the challenge we face. It's what we do in response to that challenge we face. And resilience is one of the possible outcomes. We're either resilient to that challenge or we're not. And you know, it's not. It's it's. It, this is a really important point, actually, because. Um, Resilience isn't there. There, it's not a simple binary outcome of, of, say, resilience or you know depression or resilience or PTSD or grief. It's really a. Um, there are different patterns, and this is something we've done in our work for years now. Is that resilience is one of those patterns that's a relatively healthy trajectory. As somebody who's gone through an event, and they sort of they continue to function pretty well after it, even though they're, they're, you know, they feel the stress of it, they feel the challenge of it, but they continue to function in their life pretty well. They can concentrate when they need to, they can be close to other people when they need to. That's what I would call resilience. That's it. at that particular moment in time, that's resilience. But then some people struggle more, it takes them a while longer to, to sort of get beyond the event. Some people get worse over time and some people don't recover for a long time. But those are all different patterns, and I see resilience as one of those patterns. And, and a person is resilient to an event, it doesn't guarantee they'll be resilient to the next major challenge they face. Um, did you want to say a little bit more about context, too? 
and if there are certain situations that resilience um, is really important, whereas just coping, if that well, makes sense. No, I, well, I always think of, of resilience as as the outcome to any of that. And, and the context is really where you get into the coping part of it. I, I think of coping. I've never done a lot of research per se on coping, so I don't I don't feel like I need the category at all, really. I just think of the things we do, you know. Um, and so um, I think what the context is really what what the challenge is. And each each event, even a major event, will have multiple contexts in it. So when you're the context of what one is dealing with right at this moment, it, that's the context. And how you deal with the stressors, the challenges of that context are really what 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 matters. So you know, if it's COVID, it could be you know I have to. Um, I have to go to the to the doctor tomorrow. I have to go to the hospital. I need a procedure and I can't avoid it. I don't want to be in the hospital in the middle of a COVID crisis. So that's the challenge of that moment. Or, um, you know, I, um, I need to do a certain other thing and, or I'm starting to feel a lot of stress because of I haven't been able to get any exercise or, you know, any of these things that might be challenging. Or I'm now worried about a relative or I'm worried about myself or, you know, I, I'm, uh, there's there's tension in the household because of because my college students are back home um, or something like that which you know all these are the, or my small children are you know it's hard to go outside with my small children in a city or you know we don't have a car you know I'm sorry these are all very New York centric things I'm telling you but you know <laughs> these are the kind of things that people are struggling with at different times or I'm worried about my about um, you know my job my my the place I work is not doing well and worried about money that particular point in time that might be the stressor and we have to find a way to manage that stress um, you know and, and we both have to manage it practically but also emotionally psychologically manage it. So all those things are different contexts. And I think of resilience in the broader sense. It's a much broader time frame of how we're doing overall. So so when you we've spoken before, you basically said it's really not a personality type though, resilience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason and the reason is is that I, the reason I think it's it's not really a personality type. I think that personality plays a role in resilience, you know, the type of person we are maybe make us more or less resilient and but so many other things also make us more or less resilient and when we look at these various predictors of resilience these various correlates of resilience we find overwhelmingly that they all are pretty small effects they're all they only if you if you try to make sense of who's going to be resilient or not you get a lot of little pieces there are no big pieces right so if i want to say i'm a resilient person and um, the evidence for that would be what I, my personality. Not it, it's only going to explain a little bit because it's it all depends on how you respond to a, a, the next adversity. So personality plays a little bit of role. Your social behavior plays a little bit of role. Your the resources you have at this, your disposal play a role. You have there's some genetic role. Um, there's some pretty solid evidence that there's a genetic piece to this. There's your physical health, your your immune system, how well your immune system is doing. Um, there are, um, you know, um, uh, your belief systems, you know, um, so many different factors come into play and the resources are not a small part of that. There's social resources, financial resources, all of these things play a, a, a piece of that process. And I think we tend to think that personality is the driving factor, but it really just simply is not. Statistically, you know, in terms of the research evidence, it's not. And I think that's because... I mean, I have a, a my my own personal view on this is it's because we essentialize it. We think that resilience is kind of a thing that exists in nature, and resilience is not a thing in nature. It's just how it's an outcome, right? So, if if we, we may be a kind of a healthy person, but we still have to cope with the thing that happens to us. We still have to do it on a moment by moment basis. Yeah, right. And um, one of the great things, just to add to that, one of the great things about not having resilience be a personality characteristic is if it's not my personality, if I'm not a resilient person, then yeah. I, but there's something I can do about it. Right. So like you don't, yeah. it, it, if it's a personality characteristic, you're either resilient or you're not. And there, no matter yeah. what you experience, you're not going to be resilient or no matter what you do. Yeah. But if yeah. you think of resilience as the outcome, there are things you can do 
you know, cope Absolutely. appropriately Absolutely. based on the context. <laughs> And then you can have a resilient outcome. Yeah. Um, and I think it yeah. gives hope to all of us who might think that we're not so resilient. Yeah. You know, Judy, there's always, there's always something you can do. It's fantastic. The, 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 the little bit you just said, Judy, that's fantastic. You, see, you nailed it, I think, perfectly. Because if, if we're just resilient because of who we are, there's no insight into why. Right, it doesn't tell us why. What we and, and we need to know what wow. people do. And your your work, yeah, and your work is so important in this regard. I think because you are you figure out a or you 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 are onto a piece of it, and you teach people that how to, to engage in that piece, and you're giving them tools to work with. That's so important, right? Regardless of who they are, right? Regardless of the personality. Right. Yeah. So so. I, I think um, we're getting some good questions and some of them kind of are matching up with mine. Um, so, and, and they're, they seem kind of practical, um, but I, I think they, they tap into um, the whole flexibility and, and looking for feedback to see if your coping mechanism is working. Um, one of them is basically, um, what should people do if their no normal coping me mechanisms aren't available? The gym is closed, they can't see their family and friends. What do you recommend? I would say this is when we have to get creative. This is when we have to think. And, and I think instead of thinking only about the coping mechanisms, we, ha we need to think about the context, as Judy mentioned. We need to think what is actually happening right now? What is it? I don't mean in the in the in the like sort of concrete sense, but really, if I'm if I need to be coping, that means I'm not feeling well, or I'm feeling kind of upset, or I'm feeling stressed out. And we can say, what is what's causing that? What is it that's causing that? What's the problem that that I really need to solve? And then we can think creatively about about that problem. We can try something new, um, or you know, try something we haven't maybe done before. Um, and I, I experienced this personally because I, for me, exercise was the go-to um, uh, mechanism during throughout this COVID crisis. I, I exercised many times a day, almost obsessively, because it was so helpful to me. It got me out of the house, cleared my mind, and it made me physically feel good and strong. And then I, I, I had two surgeries at two different times during this crisis. This was not my plan right, to have two surgeries. And for a period of time, each about a month each, I could not exercise. And I had to find new things I could do. I think I tried breathing exercises, which I could do despite my, my, my uh, weakened body. Um, I think I, I went back to trying meditative type things. I watched a lot of bad movies. I did not drink, but I watched a lot of bad movies. You know, so I think that it really is about being creative and we can be creative. Yeah, and I think that piece about, um, you know, what's the problem? What's causing me to feel this way? Why am I feeling bad? Um, you know, sometimes you can address the problem. So, you know, not being able to exercise was making you feel bad. So you found another way to sort of be physically active or to have that yeah. sort of physical reaction. Hmm. Sometimes the problem can't be addressed. So, you know, you are, um, forced to work from home and that's stressful. You can't be as productive as you normally will. But if you can find something in that event that you do have some control over. So I'm forced to work from home. That's really stressful. You know, maybe there's a way I can arrange my workspace so it feels more like a workspace so that I can be somewhat productive. So it's like if you can break it down into something that you can control, um, that can be really helpful. Uh, early on in the pandemic, I was, um, you know, I had my college student home and my other son's in high school. So, the, and my husband was here. So like the four of us were all here. And every day I would set a list of attainable goals for myself. And it would be really simple. Like I want to get outside once. Um, I want to, you know, make a salad for lunch. Like it, they were really simple mm -hmm. things. And I would text it to the family group chat we're all in the same house, right? So I would text, <laughs> they never really <laughs> responded, but it made me feel better. I had said, okay, here are the things I'm going to do today. And then when I was able to do it, I could cross it off. And that gave me sort of a hit of positive emotion. It wasn't really hitting the stress of the pandemic. It wasn't, you know, getting the vaccine to us any faster, but it was making me feel better and that it gave me some sense of control and that I was doing something on my list that I had written down. And then I 
actually, you know, crossing that off the list gives you sort of a hit of positive emotion. So if you can, like George says, get creative, like find something that you can control in this situation, um, that can be really helpful. Okay. Um, uh, this was a question I think that I'm interested in too. And um, someone asked, can a person be unconsciously stressed out and, and, and feel in this pandemic, especially maybe they're, they're going, they're going, but yeah, maybe it's, it's slipping out a little bit. I would I say yes. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there is a con there's a really interesting concept called MUPS, medically unexplained symptoms. Do you know this word, Judy? Mm -hmm. MUPS or this phrase? It's mm -hmm. an acronym. I I know mm -hmm. the phrase a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 Very basically normal. when you're you're experiencing stress, um, but you're not fully aware of it, or you're kind of only fleetingly aware. Of, you know, consciousness is there is no defining point, but you know, you kind of feel I'm sort of stressed out, but I'm you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to soldier on because I'm busy and I've got things to do or, or I don't want to think about it. And, and, but the stress wears us out and then these physical manifestations happen. Um, and, and, you know, the, those are clear indicators, you know, they're, they're, they're not, um, they're a little bit abstract because say it's a back problem or, a, you know, a digestive problem or a skin problem or anything else or a, you know, fatigue or something that's a result of the stress. But yeah, I mean, we can, I don't think we, it, I wouldn't use the word unconscious stress, but I think mm -hmm. um, you can, you can, uh, you can keep it pretty remote from your awareness. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think this often comes out in um, just having negative emotions, but not really being aware of why. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people yeah. don't have a lot of insight into why they're feeling what they're feeling. So sometimes you can just be, you know, that's, it's like when you, you know, you're feeling angry and you kick the dog. I mean, the dog didn't do anything, but you're, you're feeling this emotion and you're attributing it to the dog. Um, but really it's, you know, something else that's going on in your environment that you aren't fully aware of why that's causing you or that, that that's the source of your negative emotions. Right. And, and, and this is kind of related to that, um, and it's, it's a little bit different from what someone asked, but um, so let's say maybe the person you're sharing a house with seems to be having a lot of negative emotions, but maybe they're not emotionally aware that they are stressed. Is there is there a way to talk to, to people in your house or in your family um, if you think they're stressed? and? Well, George, you're the clinically trained one here, so you you take this one. Oh my God, um, that's, a, that's really a tough question. This is a way above my pay grade. This one, um, the, I say, I think this is really a, a complicated question because it really it's about relationships and families, and and um, and I feel um, I'm barely barely you know I don't have a great answer to that question. I really don't. Because um, it really, it's so idiosyncratic, I think, within personalities and families, you know. Although I think there's probably um, some pretty good evidence, my memory's a little vague here, that that um, there's a kind of a contagion around these kinds of emotions, though. So being mm -hmm. a, around someone who's mm -hmm. feeling a lot of negative emotion makes life harder, basically, you know, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. over time. And some emotions like like sad faces pull for sympathy from other people. We know this, there's pretty good research on that, but they it's all very time limited, right? So if you're making, a person's making a sad face and it makes me want to feel bad for them, that's going to wear, after a while, that's going to wear on me and I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna to to push them away, right? So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of talking about it, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, that's such a complicated question. I wouldn't venture to an answer that. I think I, whatever I would say would probably be wrong. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think with with some types of coping too, it's um, it's really hard. Maybe e even harder with people you're close with to say, you know what you should be doing. You should really look on the bright side here. This is what you need to do. So it, you know, with which you know that that that's one of that that skill that I just said that looking on the bright side is it's called positive reappraisal, and it's something that I teach as part of our program. Um, so, you know, my kids know what this is and they know what I do. Um, but I 
I would never try to positively reappraise anything for them. Like I wouldn't say, you know, sorry, you didn't make the team look on the bright side. Now you have more time to do your homework. I mean, like, like you can't, you can't do it for other people, but what you can do, you know, with kids is you can role model it. So like, you know, I, I'm not good at hiding how I feel or what I'm doing anyway. So like they see it. So they see the way I cope with things. And, you know, over the years, they've started to sort of adopt some of this, um, you know, I'm happy to see it. Um, but it wasn't because I said, here are the things that you, I'm an expert in stress and coping. And here are the things you need to do, right? I think yeah. it may be particularly dangerous if you're a psychologist, like you don't want to be going at your family and telling them what to do. Um, but you can role model it um, and sort of do the things that you hope that they'll do. Um, and maybe that will work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, there's someone who asks, um, how can you um, help people who are isolated? Because um, they feel mm -hmm. like the stress of isolation is taking a very big toll um, actually on their clients. So that might be a, a therapist or something. Um, mm -hmm. thing of like trying to do for someone else, whereas they kind of need to come to it themselves. Well, I think you could probably get people if if you're if you're having a conversation with with somebody, you could probably help them brainstorm, um, you know, ways they could they could try to alleviate that loneliness. I had an interesting conversation with actually a, a colleague who is working kind of some of the flexibility ideas I've, I've developed is trying to implement them in a um, in a hospital setting with people who are dealing with very serious stressors. And she had told me that she was using lists of possible coping behaviors. And I had said, which is my typical response, well, I don't really like the idea of list of behaviors because it implies like these are the right behaviors or these are the magic behaviors or the key traits or whatever. And, and she said what I thought was very astute. She had said, well, you know, when people are stressed out and really struggling, they're not thinking real clearly. So giving them a list of options or even just here, you know, take a look at this list of things, try some of these things can actually be very helpful. And it turns out if you Google, like, you know, traits of resilience or lists of coping behaviors, all kinds of stuff comes up and you get ideas of what you can try or ways to combat loneliness. If you Googled that, probably lots of different things would come up right now or isolation. And, you know, you can look through those things and go through these same steps we've been talking about. But what am I really struggling with here? And if it's isolated, I'm feeling isolated, will any of these things, are any of these things feasible? Let me try one of these things and see what happens, right? I'll collect, you know, I'll, I'll try it and see what happens. What, 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 what is the result if I try this, you know? Um, yeah. How do you evaluate if the coping mechanism isn't working and it's time to move on to something to try something. Well, I, think, I think that's that's pretty basic. I mean, I always think of it in, in two terms. There's at least two basic sort of, for lack of a better word, kinds of feedback. One is your own body. You know, if you're feeling uneasy, if you're feeling like you need to cope with something, you're feeling isolated and lonely. Do you feel less lonely when you try something? That you know, it's the, the, your own emotional reactions change. Um, you know, and then some other things are more amenable to what you what other people you know, show you with her, you know, other, you know, if someone's telling you, you look stressed out or you look unwell, that's feedback that you're not doing well. But if that, you know, you get a different reaction out of people or people engage with you more, that's other kinds of feedback. But I think really that our own bodies, our own inner state is really the best yeah. source of information. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say your emotional reaction. So you can, it, you know, if you have a certain level of awareness of the emotions you're experiencing, you're experiencing a negative emotion, you try some coping and it changes that emotion for the better, then that's useful feedback or doesn't change it. That's also useful feedback, right? So it's sort of, it's the bit of being able to be in touch with your emotions that you're experiencing and sort of be aware of how they're changing in response to whatever you're trying. Okay, I'm pay paying attention kind of. Mm -hmm. oh, um. Let me see. Um, th this is an interesting question. I don't know um, if, if 
is there a way to kind of um, move beyond people? Someone asked, can you learn to be more flexible if you're just naturally a rigid person? Um, yes. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, you know, actually, um, if I may, may, may speak to that, I, I, one of the reasons I got interested in flexibility is because I've been studying resilience, the kind of resilience I've described for about 25 years now. And I got very tired of people talking about building resilience, which is what a very nice idea, but I think it's very hard to do that because resilience is such a complicated thing and it's so momentary, you know, from moment to moment. But I got very interested in flexibility about 15 years ago because I think flexibility, which is really what Judy and I have been talking about in a sense, mm -hmm. is, is learnable. It's something that we can, we can break it down to these pieces and actually, actually, um, teach it. And funny thing is, is that um, I don't do much in the way of intervention now, but in the course of I'm just finishing a book on this, this, these newer ideas, and I got interested in self-talk. I don't know if you've ever played around with self-talk, Judy, but I found it quite fascinating, you know, that you can make self-talk for, you know, I started thinking of these questions. What's, what's the problem here? What's happening to me? What, what do I need to do? What am I able to do? Is it working? Those are all like questions we can ask ourselves, self-talk questions, you know, and you can also kind of give ourselves little pep talks. I can do it. You know, Ethan Cross has this really interesting research on, um, it's uh, third, like third person pronouns and so, or using your own name. So you would say, you know, Judy, you might just say, Judy, come on, you can do this. Or Judy, you know, you know, you know, you would be telling do it all the time. You know. Yeah, exactly. And so it feels a little odd. and to use your own name to talk to yourself that way. But, um, you know, we can, we can I think, kind of uh, break it down to these pieces and practice these pieces. So I think, I really think people can, can learn these things, you know, can, can move the needle to some extent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. See that, or we just have about five more minutes. Um, and I, I wondered if, the, what are kind of some of the big questions um, about stress, coping, resilience, whichever that that you guys are are hoping to answer um, in your work in the coming years. And Judy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. the The big question driving my work now is, um, you know, if if we take this program that we've developed, um, how do we what how do we deliver it so that people will learn the skills and take them up as a habit um, and then you know carry them forward so what what works which parts of this work for whom <laughs> how do we have to tailor the program for different people to make it work so we you know we were delivering this set of skills or teaching this set of skills and when people do them they're helpful so how do we tailor the program, how do we deliver it? How do we make it easy to take up and make a habit um, so that it can it can work for people for whatever type of stress they're experiencing? So that's sort of the big the big driver for our, our research right now. I thought um, you were I doing a survey. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I, oh, I asked Judy if she was doing a survey about the pandemic stress or trying to use your um, we're, We are doing a test of this program. Yeah. So we are doing a, a test of this program sort of in the general public. Um, so, uh, you know, we do a survey at baseline to see how they're doing, look at depression, anxiety, emotions, and then they can learn this program through it's an online self-guided program. And then we measure their well-being at the end again. Um, and it, you know, in early, we've just been doing it for a few months, but it looks like people who go through the program are doing better in terms of depression, anxiety, social isolation, positive emotion, meaning and purpose. So like all the things, um, they're improving over time if they practice these skills. Doesn't mean that we're fixing everything, but it, it looks like we're able to teach people these skills um, and that it is helpful when they do them. Were you going to send me a link to that that I could put on yes. our page at the end of this? Yes. So, yes, George, I will you, do that. you tell us a little bit about about what 
questions you're hoping to answer. I know you just finished a book, um, yes. so you have a little more time to do research on what is the end of trauma? Is that <laughs> yeah. what it was called? The book, the book is called The End of Trauma, yes. Um, and um, I think what, what, what I'm working on right now is I'm really trying to, we've been, been doing a lot of research throughout the COVID crisis, whatever, in whatever way we can, but I'm, I'm really interested in how the pieces fit together. So we've talked about a lot of different pieces of this problem of how people deal with stress and how they come out and the other end of it and how they're okay. And I'm particularly interested in, in these different pieces. And we've really, the, the preliminary work we've done with flexibility where we've looked at you know, reading the context, having a repertoire of coping behaviors, monitoring and adjusting, we've actually found that most people are sort of reasonably good at all these things. Because most people are resilient and it makes sense most people would be reasonably good. But then of course we have variation. And one of the things we found was that, that reading the context, paying attention to the context is more important even than the other pieces of this puzzle. And I think that's not something that has received much attention. Um, that you, know, you really have to sort of figure out what is it that's, that I'm dealing with right now in order to deal with it. Best. And it, so it almost doesn't matter how good your coping is if you're not reading the situation properly, if you're not kind of paying attention to what's happening to you. And that was kind of a little bit of a newer, that's what we kind of thought we'd find, but it was a little bit of a newer finding, you know, and as, as a researcher, I want to replicate this. And so we're, we're you know, really make sure that this is correct. But also there's so much more to it. I think that this, the, uh, you, I'm not- it, what's an Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, I yeah. was just asking what no, if there's an example of that. Oh. Of of what? Of reading the context? Yes. Or, um, well, say um, okay. Um, you you go into a um, a situation and um, with with friends and you're feeling uneasy. Say uh, you know, or you're, you're you didn't have a good evening in a in a grabbing of friends, or you're. Um, uh, you know, you you you're you're at your job or something, and and um, uh, the uh, you know there's so many examples. I'm struggling to actually name one that um, you know that it, it's any time really we're in a situation and we're just not dealing with it well. We're feeling uneasy with it. You you meet um, a, a new friend or you 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 meet a new relative or you're in a person you haven't been with before and there's something that's not working or you're um, you're feeling not so good. Often you hear people say you know they're just not feeling great someday, but they don't know why. And I think we can pay attention to what are actually is, is happening to me? What is making me feel uneasy like this or, or why? Um, you know, I think a, a couple of weeks ago, I was outside running in the, in the park in New York and I, and I was almost a, kind of ran into a couple of very strange characters who wanted to fight with me. And I wasn't exactly sure why that was. Um, and I still am not 100% sure, but then I found myself uh, being uneasy about this for a few days later, but I wasn't sure what it was that I was uneasy about. Was it my own safety? Was it that I didn't understand the situation? Was it that I didn't do something I should have done? You know, and I think thinking that through, it helped me realize what the actual problem was that I could then address. And I, you know, it, 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 there's so many possible examples. It's, it's almost even hard to name one because every, literally every time we're feeling somewhat uneasy, there's usually something's happening to us that's causing it. And often we don't know what it is, we're not paying attention. And paying attention is more than just, a, it means really like trying to think, what is it that's, you know, what is it that's bothering me? When, when and what can I do about it, et cetera. Um, but you know, I, I, I think all of this is at still at a very simple level. And that's one of the things I'm very interested in now is trying to get as many of these pieces together. We have the tools now, we have machine learning and we have these other approaches. And we're playing around with, with machine learning a lot now because it has surprises in it. You know, what is it that's sort of driving the situation? But I mean, this will keep me busy for a long time, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, my last thing I know we're over time is any specific tips for the holidays because I know for me, it's it's just a stressful time of year. Um, anything people can do? I think Judy's probably got the answer to this one because it's there's something I, uh, about the it. answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I would start with self compassion. Know that everyone's having a hard time. Many people are really suffering. It's okay if you're feeling bad. Don't have the same expectations that you might 
normally have for the holiday season for, um, you know, feeling festive and joyful, like, um, just know that, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're all in this together. Um, uh, and that, uh, you know, there, there is reason for hope and that you can sort of focus on that, but get, cut yourself some slack, uh, yeah. this holiday season is my yeah. number one tip. That sounds like a, oh, that yeah. sounds like a good one. Um, and thanks you guys so much for um, joining us today. That was really fun. Um, I know that there was way, may, way more questions. Um, we will be posting this um, video um, moment, you know, today probably or tomorrow on our website, knowablemagazine.org. Um, eventually we'll also get the transcript posted. Um, and if there's any chance to answer additional questions, we'll try to do that. Um, it's been great. really great having you here. Thank you so much. Um, if you, oh, I am supposed to give a little talk. Um, this, thanks to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for the wonderful support of Knowable Magazine. And of course, um, special thanks again to Judy and George. Um, we will also be posting on our website um, on the page with this video additional resources including articles that judy and george have authored for the annual reviews journals that will be available for free to read from that page um, i wanted to remind you as well of, of that this is a series of conversation as part of our reset the science of crisis and recovery um, the next one will be held december 16th and we're going to be talking about the origin and spread of viruses from animals to humans and preventing the next spillover event. Um, the best way to keep up with everything that we're up to is to sign up for our weekly newspa newsletter, newspaper. Um, also, if you enjoyed what you saw today and you enjoy reading Knowable, um, we are currently, we just launched our first donation campaign to get, gain supporters, even $5 a month can help us. So please go to our website and donate. Um, that's all for me. Please stay flexible, cope well, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.